unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. In 2015, the historian Ram Guha wrote an essay in the Indian magazine Caravan that ruffled a lot of feathers. Guha remarked that while India had a right-wing political party in power, the country lacked a serious right-wing intellectual ecosystem. A new book by the author and entrepreneur Jerry Rao argues that India, in fact, has a long and ancient tradition of right-wing thought. Rao's book, The Indian Conservative, A History of Indian Right-Wing Thought, examines the contribution conservative ideas have made and could make in the future to the economy, politics, culture, society, and the aesthetics of India. Jerry Rao is the founder of Emphasis, a leading Indian IT firm. He is also a widely respected columnist and author. He joins me today in the Hindu Sun Times studio in New Delhi. Jerry, congratulations on the book and thanks for coming by. Thank you, Merlin. It's good to be here. So I want to start with a kind of definitional point for our Mm -hmm. listeners. Uh, In your own words, what defines conservatism? Who is a conservative? I think conservatives are people who are, by nature, reluctant to give up the good things of the past. Therefore, they are people who believe in gradualism. It's not that they're against change. But they are very, very concerned that our ancestors have left us with a great legacy and we should not tamper with it and change it uh, brusquely or or abruptly. That is is basically the the fundamental core spirit of conservatism. I uh, I note that in your definition, you didn't say anything about the relative role of individuals versus the state. How important is that in terms of conservative ideology? Conservatives tend to be suspicious of a nanny state. They tend to be suspicious of of an intrusive sovereign uh, and are much more comfortable with clubs, Sangeet Sabhas, Bhajan Mandalis, uh, voluntary associations, uh, civic associations, rather than have the sovereign intrude into their affairs. That's a that's a very very conservative trait. Uh, you live in America, so you know about uh, De Tocqueville's book, uh, where he talks about this being very fundamental to the development of a conservative ethos in America. So. You argue in the book that, you know, on the one hand, you have very ancient roots of conservatism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You also have some modern avatars. Mm-hmm. I was wondering if you might give us a few examples of, you know, who would you consider to be the leading lights of the conservative tradition, both from the kind of ancient strand mm-hmm. as well as the more modern contemporary yeah. strand? I think the ancient strand particularly is important because these two texts that I f- frequently keep referring to in my book, the Shanti Parva of the Mahabharata, and the Tirukkural by Tiruvalluvar in Tamil represent what I call, I refer to frequently as foundational texts of our civilization, our culture, our country. And the reason I say they are foundational texts is by and large, the Orientalist and today the Marxist view of of Indian thought is it's all speculative, it's all um, uh, metaphysical, it's all... uh, uh, otherworldly uh, and and uh, Indian thinkers basically retreat to Himalayan caves uh, and don't engage with the world. Now that is completely demolished in these two texts. This is about individuals and individuals living in society, in active communities, and the relationship between the two. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of other texts. The the Apastama Sutra of the Ajurveda is an important one because the, the idea that dharma or, or righteousness, virtue, changes with each age, the concept of yoga dharma is first enunciated in the Apastama Sutra. Uh, from an environmental conservation point of view, another very important text would be the Atharva Veda itself. But I would go back again and again to Shanti Parva of the Mahabharata and to uh, Tiruvalluvar Tirukkural. Uh, they are concerned primarily with this world. Uh, we have four kind of objectives of human existence in ancient Indic thought. Uh, artha, 
in in the Shanti Parvartha is refers to really uh, economic and political activity, uh, which uh, in uh, Tamil is referred to as Porul. Um, uh, dharma, which in Tamil is Aram, is about virtue and 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 uh, ethical living. Uh, Kama, which is about passion in Sanskrit, as the Inbam in Tamil, is about passion and aesthetics. Now, the interesting thing is everybody concedes that the fourth one, moksha, salvation is the most important, but both the Shanti Parva and the Tirukkural kind of very cleverly, mischievously will say, hey, you these do the first three things correctly, salvation will automatically take care of itself. It'll take care of itself. So this idea that we are otherworldly is rejected by these two texts. It's very much about living in this world. And both of these texts are very clear about uh, limitations on the sovereign. The the general view in, in world uh, political thinking is before the Magna Carta in England, uh, the sovereign had untrammeled powers in, in most parts of the world. Uh, that's not true. Uh, the sovereign's powers were limited uh, both by tradition, by custom, and by uh, by, by intellectual uh, rigor uh, in, in, in the Shanti Parva and in the and in and, and in the Tirukkural. Uh, the ancient Indians, by the way, were very very worried about one thing. The one thing that filled them with horror, where the their hair would stand up, is Matsya Nyaya. Matsya Nyaya is where the big fish eat the small fish. Yeah. Where there's a where there's an anarchic breakdown in community relations and uh, tyranny uh, and violence can 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 uh, get the upper hand, and the role of the sovereign is really this: is to prevent matsya nyaya. That is that's the primary role. It's not to impose his or her own will on the subjects, but to prevent matsya nyaya, prevent uh, the big fish swallowing the small fish uh, within our communities. So you have this set of ancient traditions which go back, and of course they've been built upon over time. Uh, who would you identify as the kind of modern yeah. um, manifestations of some of this conservative intellectual uh, tradition? I'd, I'd like to spend one minute on somebody who's pre-modern or early modern, 500 years ago, uh, Allah Sami Pedana, uh, who was a, a court poet in Krishna Devaraya's court in the Vijayanagar Empire. Um, he wrote an extraordinary book called Manu Charitama, which is a, a, a rendering of the appearance of the first man and woman on this planet after the great flood. Uh, and it's, that originally was written more than a thousand years ago in the uh, Markandeya Purana. And there's a revised version that uh, Pedana writes. So in some sense, around the time that there was the Renaissance happening in Europe and uh, uh, people were defining the world in human terms rather than in divine terms, there was a, an intellectual in India doing that too. And he, he, he represents, to my mind, what I would call early modern or pre-modern conservatism. Having said that, really it's 19th century, and it's the two big figures, Ramon Roy and Bankim, who represent the two most important strands or schools of Indian culture. This is Bankim Chatterjee. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, yes. Let me sort of transition to where you uh, go next in the book, which is talking about economics. Mm -hmm. And you discuss the real need for modern Indian conservatism in the economic sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, we're recording this in 2020. For the past uh, almost six years, India has had a right of center party in power in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have argued that it's a culturally right party, but actually, if you look at it closely, an economically left one. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I think there is there's, there's a considerable uh, merit to what you're saying, because if you look at the slogan, uh, Maximum governance, minimum government, which was a slogan in the twenty fourteen right, that was really election, a in election campaign. One expected a Thatcher or a Reagan kind of dispensation, and we've not had it. Um, so there is this concern that uh, uh, the the uh, the original promise 
of a of a minimal state is is in fact not happening uh and uh, the old intrusive uh, uh socialist state continues and in some some areas it might have actually expanded so that 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 is something there's not been any aggressive privatization um i think the bankruptcy law is probably a good good move in 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 the direction of markets but there's not been sufficient pro market uh, market friendly activity and that is something that is a matter of concern now in the run up to the 2014 election it was very interesting to watch there was a kind of feud between two sets of economists on the one hand you had uh, jagdish bhagwati arvind panagaria who are well known pro market voices in in economics both in india uh, and in the united states then on the other hand you have amartya sen and jean drez who were two economists who were uh, you know widely celebrated by the political left they both in some sense had a role to play in advising the previous congress led upa government i was intrigued in your book that you actually call sen and drez conservative economists mm-hmm. how do they in your view kind of fit this mold no actually i don't call them conservative economists they are not what i do mention is that there are conservative strands to their thinking okay. we should not dismiss both of them are extremely intelligent people they are not simple minded status that's the point i'm trying to make sen uh, is concerned about human capacity and capabilities but sen has also written extensively on the strangulation of the indian entrepreneur uh by by a rigid state and drez has written extensively about the lack of state capacity state wants to do good <laughs> you know claims that it wants to do good but it it's unable to do so i'm just drawing attention that let's not um simply ignore them entirely being conservative saying hey we won't read them because uh they're left wing there are elements to their thought which are very very uh intriguing and very very uh, uh stuff that we we should appreciate and i suppose then the unifying theme really between the, the traditional conservative economists and and folks like dresden sen is that both sets agree that the state has a fundamental role to play in 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 delivering basic public goods and mm-hmm. providing law and order and dispensing justice and collecting mm-hmm. revenue right i mean that's something both sides mm-hmm. basically agree on yeah but uh, i would again keep going back that i think in the in the old tirukkural tradition it would be a a very minimalist state from the perspective of the conservative not a nanny state that that is something that we will keep on reemphasizing So you spend some time in the book trying to situate or locate the proponents of Hindu nationalism kind of on this ideological spectrum. Mm-hmm. And where you seem to come down on that score as far as I can tell and you can correct me if I'm wrong is that Hindu nationalism as we understand it today is a subset of the conservative movement but it cannot be reduced to it. Correct, is absolutely. That, is that a right the way? The conservative movement is much bigger than the Hindu nationalist movement. the hindu nationalist movement is a legitimate subset a legitimate part of the overall conservative movement but there are uh, movements in the political sphere like the swatantra etc which are not hindu nationalist movements which are also extremely conservative so uh, that's that is exactly i think you phrased it quite correctly uh, it's a subset it's a legitimate subset i think one of the problems is with with a lot of uh, uh marxist scholars is they tend to be dismissive of hindu nationalism as if it's illegitimate i don't buy that i think it's legitimate but it's not the only thing there's other things in indian conservatism so in several places throughout the book you do express concern however about the fact that the hindu nationalist movement has uh, oftentimes been either unwell uh, unable excuse me or unwilling to rein in what you refer to as you know quote unquote extreme elements and given the many stakeholders that comprise the sang parivar of which you know the bjp is just one it's its political manifestation do you think that this is kind of inherently an unstable equilibrium meaning that given how many diverse voices there are representing different aspects of hindu conservatism that there is bound to be a kind of quite regular push and pull between more extreme and more uh, and less extreme forces i think so i think this um, creative tension uh, hopefully creative and not destructive tension will will always be there 
Uh, let's consider the economic side for a minute. There will always be elements within Hindu nationalism who will be against free trade, um, will be suspicious of markets. Uh, and uh, uh, I've argued, I think, in the last chapter somewhere that our job as conservatives is to uh, work on the caucuses within uh, the movement, Hindu nationalist movement, who are more market friendly and, you know, kind of uh, uh, bring bring them around to our point of view. Uh, on the on the uh, political side, I think, uh, again, and this is a problem not just for Hindu nationalism, this is a problem for all nationalisms, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, Irish or uh, American or whatever. And certainly in the 20th century, we've seen it uh, in extreme terms in Germany, um, the there is a danger of a pathological extremist violent group uh, becoming the dominant group. And that's something I think it's in their own interest that Hindu nationalists watch out for. Because uh, as I've mentioned somewhere in the book, this uh, extreme violence and othering and so on can actually backfire. I found this part of the book quite interesting because it harkens back to some of the work that Rajni Kotari, the famous yeah. Indian political scientist, and you, you, you cite him quite extensively, did back in the 1960s and 70s, which is to say you had a Congress-dominant system that was a hegemonic force, and the role political competition played, it's not as if it was absent, it was very much present, but the objectives oftentimes were to influence different caucuses within uh, the Congress Party. So whether that was a, a conservative economic uh, caucus, whether that was a more uh, Hindu traditionalist caucus, whether that was a more communist or left or socialist caucus, um, is that the sort yes. of dynamic you're referring I to? I think one party dominant democracy is the way Kothari described it and then said, how is it still democratic? The way it is, is that there will be K. Munshi uh, in the Congress who will represent a, a Hindu a uh, thing. There will be Krishna Menon who will represent a communist thing. Uh, so there, there, there will be different uh, caucuses that that uh, uh, people outside the Congress would cultivate in order to influence the Congress. Now I think, given my kind of so sober conclusion that a revival of the Swatantra is not on the cards. Those of us who have Swatantra tendencies, I think our job is to influence caucuses in every party, in the BJP, in the Congress, in, in Trinamool, uh, you know, we should not write off even regional parties. In every one of them, we need to find those people who are market friendly, who are believers in minimalist states, uh, and who are kind of worried about Matsyanyaya and, you know, work on them, support them. That's that's the strategy, not try to set up a new party or revive an old Swatantra party. That's so not going to work. Let, let's bookmark that because I want to come back to that yeah. at the end. I think it's an important point uh, to, to discuss the Swatantra party and its, its uh, potential revival maybe in a different form. But let me first take us to the issue of culture, um, mm -hmm. which, again, you have a separate chapter on. And, uh, you know, you make the point that really if you, you look at Indian culture, the kind of starting premise – is a concern with the sacred. Now, I'm wondering to that end, how and whether secularism is truly compatible with the conservative vision of India, because, you know, some people have argued that it's not, given that um, religion plays such an important role in people's daily lives that it would be unreasonable or impractical for the state to be completely uh, uh, sort of arm's length uh, with, with religious faith. It's not so much about religious faith as about uh, a you know what uh, Basham refers to as the the Indian concern with the transcendental, and India therefore is viewed as a sacred geography. Uh, the idea that uh, India simply lines on a map on a piece of paper uh, and the map as inherited from our erstwhile British rulers, and it's therefore, and, and in, everything inside it is, is India, and it's a civic nation state, is frankly a little absurd. It's a little ridiculous, because it's not. Uh, when in 47 to 50, in that time period, they wrote the constitution, and they opened with we the people, 
they were talking about a, 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 a people united by a culture or at least um, put together by a culture, if not completely united. That's because we are a diverse country uh, and not simply uh, lines on a map. Uh, so this one, I think, is uh, uh, trying to be like the French Republic uh, with La Cite or something is ridiculous. It's absurd. And frankly, it's not what we've done. If you look at it, we have lions from Ashoka's pillar as our emblem. We have Satyameva Vijayate, which is a, uh, you know, Upanishadic thing as our uh, uh, national. So we, we, we've tried to, uh, we, but we, we've tried to kind of pretend, at least in recent times, many people have tried to pretend that we are like the French Republic. And I think that that's, that's not, that's not on. Uh, in chapter four of your book, I believe it is, you credit Prime Minister Nehru for taking several steps in the mid 1950s mm -hmm. to reform Hinduism through a series of, uh, they were quite controversial at the time, of course, Hindu reform bills. Now, today, many culturally conservative Indians believe that the state should really refrain from intervening in religious affairs to try to, say, remedy illiberal aspects of, of religion because change should really come from sort of society. Now, I'm wondering whether or not that is uh, a realistic assumption. I mean, does the state have a constructive role to play say, in taking on things like triple talaq, which is uh, something... That I think they about. have a, a, a limited understanding of our history. Let us take a look at temple management. Sorry, when me. you say they, who are you referring Those to? Those who are saying that the state should step back. I see. The state in India is inextricably intertwined with religious matters. Let us take a look at temple management, for instance. In, in the state of Mysore, where we had a Hindu Maharaja, there was a department called Muzrai Department. It was a department of the state which managed temples. Um, the East India Company till 1830, uh, from, uh, from like 1760 onwards, was the management in charge of the Tirupati Temple. Right. And then it was transferred to a Mahant, and then it was taken back by the government of the Madras presidency in 1920. So this idea that the state and, and religious matters can be left separated and religious reform can happen only uh, by, by voluntary stuff within religions is a silly idea. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the Maharaja of Travancore intervened and allowed the entry of Dalits into, into Hindu temples in the 1930s when Mahatma Gandhi requested him to do so. So the, the, there was an actual act there. So this, this I, I, uh, I think we need to be very clear that um, once we have made this case that India is really about the sacred, then to kind of do this artificial distinction of separation of church and state, uh, which is um, which is really a very again a very French and American idea. It's not there even in England. Uh, is 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 it doesn't make any sense. I think the state has a role, um, and uh, uh, it's it's got to be a calibrated law role. It's it can't be something that's very intrusive or or very insensitive. Uh, but uh, in fact, if you look at the state-managed temples yes. in southern India, they're cleaner and better run than many of the privately owned temples in northern India. Just as, you know, it's, it's an anecdotal, it's yeah. not a statistical right. evidence that I'm providing, but that tells you something there. I mean, I guess the what, what conservatives would argue today is that... Um, What's really important is that the state acts in an even-handed manner, right? So the doctrine of secularism as it, as it is known in India is really about the state keeping a kind of principal distance from religion. In other words, uh, it can intervene uh, uh, in religious affairs, but it has to do so in an even-handed basis. And uh, the critique would be that the state took steps to reform Hindu social practices, but didn't do so when it came to other religious traditions. I, I and... think I think there's there's no doubt about it that if you now went up and met Nehru up in the sky, he would he would express uh, a certain level of regret 
that in 55, 56, when he uh, did do the major reform yes. in, in Hindu marriages and Hindu succession acts, um, he, he missed an opportunity to do the same with Muslims and Christians. And subsequently, Christians have been done. Parsis still have not got had a sufficient reform. Uh, but um, um, uh, yes, I think that was a miss. Um, question really is, um, uh, was it uh, politically uh, possible at that time, given that uh, it was only eight years after partition? I don't know. It's very difficult to look at those counterfactuals. But one thing is for sure, I think uh, 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 certainly uh, Nehru let down Muslim women, if nothing else. I want to turn to the final kind of thematic chapter in the book, which is about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And in it, um, you're you're quite full of praise for uh, the tradition of Indian art, music, theater, and film. But the the one area that you really single out for criticism is education, and 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 you're not the only one, of course, as a literature on this. Um, I'm wondering, from a conservative view, what is the conservative critique? of India's education regime? And if you look to the future going forward, what is the way out? I think to start with, if you go back and look, there seems to be considerable evidence that Elizabethan England had achieved 50% literacy. And certainly Maria Theresa's Austria, uh, Bismarck's Germany, Meiji Japan, all these countries focused on creating a literate population. We still have 30% illiteracy in India. 30% on a base of 1.2 billion people is a hell of a lot of people yeah. who can't read, write, and count. And it seems to me that we collectively cannot uh, live up to our promise and our potential if this is not fixed. And until the Vajpayee regime, there wasn't even a service shiksha abhiyan in the country. Yeah. Which is one of the major <laughs> centrally sponsored schemes to promote primary but, education. But it's, uh, it's still, I mean, it's now we have schools, physical buildings within a couple of kilometers of every child, but uh, teachers don't turn up a lot of the time. And, you know, the issue we, is what happens within we, those we have We have operating problems. At least we have a first step. Um, this, to my mind, is, is, uh, is a failure because... Uh, we we as we we have to uh, understand that the, 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 the human potential because um, you know, remember our uh, uh, covenant, if you will, as conservatives as Burke Edmund Burke talks about it, is both with our ancestors and with our descendants, and to the extent extent we fail our children by not educating them, we are failing in that covenant. The second area on education where I've really kind of um, spent some time talking about is how higher education has become a bit of a joke. Uh, the best Indian molecular biologists, uh, genetic oncologists, uh, metallurgists, they're all doing research in uh, America or, or Europe. Do you know that the best Indian uh, uh, critics of Telugu literature and Upper Brahmsha literature are also outside India. Mm. We are outsourcing virtually all knowledge creation and uh, uh, India has the largest number of whatever foreign students uh, country which sends a large... Are we so, so going to be proud of this? That our education system is so completely collapsed that we are funding... Uh, uh, universities overseas and we are funding uh, um, and, uh, and our best minds are doing research there and there's not any new knowledge being created here. This is a major problem because uh, uh, frankly in 47 we inherited a fairly decent uh, higher education system. Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, Allahabad, these were good universities and they had world class kind of uh, Andhra, they had world class uh, uh, kind of credentials. We've let them go down. We've tried to recreate new stuff around IITs and IIMs, uh, but not sufficient. And um, I just think uh, we need to get back to the pursuit of, of excellence, and that can only be done through autonomy. Um, because a king gives money for a college, you can name the college King's College, <laughs> but you don't then tell the 
vice chancellor of that college, uh, <coughs> whether he can travel economy class or business class, how many conferences he can attend, uh, uh, how, what he should pay his senior professors. I mean, come on, that is their decision, and that we have to give them autonomy and give them flexibility. If we do, I think we've missed the bus quite a bit, but in the next 20 years, we might actually have a Nobel laureate uh, living in India and winning the prize rather than uh, the present situation. Right. Um, towards the end of the book, you sort of lament the fact that the space for reasoned, empirical, uh, passionate, but yet um, civil mm -hmm. dialogue in India has been badly squeezed. And I'm wondering, you know, if you could reflect a bit on what you think are some of the factors that have led to this sort of closing space, if you want to call it that. I think the root cause is excessive regulation. Excessive regulation in every sphere has made us an extremely litigious society. And we pass so many laws, but we don't increase the number of courts and judges. So the new laws all create more litigation and the uh, judicial system is unable to cope with it. So we're in a kind of endless traffic jam. This creates a, 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 you know, a, 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 a situation where everybody sees a benefit in being litigious. Uh, and uh, uh, we are unable to come together and agree on anything and move. And in fact, when we do try to make changes, if you look at some of the changes we've made, for instance, I've been screaming for years that we need an environmental protection agency like in the United States. No, we didn't create that because we're all scared of executive power and whatever executive power exists, we want it to be as discretionary as possible. But we did create something called a National Green Tribunal, one more judicial body which is underfunded, which <laughs> for, for many months they didn't have place, space to sit. And, you know, and they, that's created one more jamming of the system. So this is a self-inflicted wound, in my opinion, that our society has done of... Um, uh, the moment you want to build a, a road, three of us will be in the court the next day with uh, public interest litigation. We won't come and meet you and talk to you and say, hey, why don't you realign the road? And and you won't uh, give in because if you give in even a little bit, who knows what will happen to you? So everybody takes extremely polarized. Look at the highways we are building through the jungles. There are many ways we can do these things, but both the highway department and the environmentalists are simply refusing to talk. In, in, look, other countries, the Thames or whatever, uh, was, was a dirty river 50 years ago. They've cleaned it up. They get together and they get stuff done. Here, for everything, we, we seem to uh, get into extremely polarized and extremely paralyzed situations, uh, nation in gridlock, I sometimes refer to it, um, we have to break this. This, the, this Gordian knot has to be cut. And there I'm saying, let us as conservatives be the first to initiate this dialogue. Um, you know, let's say, hey, all of us want the same thing. We want to leave a good environment for our children and grandchildren. And I've made reference, if you uh, uh, remember, to Burke's famous uh, Prince of Arcot speech in the House of Commons, where Burke, I mean, 300 years ago, 250 years ago, the man says he praises India's kings. He says the Rajas of India uh, built canals and reservoirs not for their benefit, but for the benefit of future generations. So I think that thing, we should take the initiative. I do not see the left taking the initiative because they've become so shrill and hysterical. I think we should take the initiative to start this dialogue. I want to end this conversation by going back to uh, the discussion of this with Antar Party. I think, especially for some of our international listeners, maybe you could just give a, a, a brief synopsis of, 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 of what the party was, what role they played. But then let me just ask you, uh, many conservative intellectuals have written in the Western media, the Indian media, about the need for a 21st century Swatantra party. It sounds like what you're saying, that 
goal or objective is a pipe dream, and instead the focus should be on how conservative-minded Indians from all walks of life can instead influence the major political formations, whether it's the BJP who's in power today or the Congress party who is in power for 10 years or, or regional parties themselves to try to push them in the direction. So tell us a little about the Swatantra okay. Party and then uh, whether they can be resurrected or not. The Swatantra Party was formed in about 57 or 58 uh, after the the ruling Congress Party in India formally adopted socialism as its political creed. Um, and it was formed in order to oppose uh, excessive government control of the economy and of the body politic. Swatantra means freedom. So it was a freedom party. And the the, the eminence Greece of the Swatantra Party, Rajagopalachari, coined the expression permit license Raj. Mm -hmm. He said that the government of India was basically in the business of giving out permits and licenses to people, and this was the, the, the dispensation. And Minu Masani, who was the founder of the party, basically argued that this beginning of economic uh, creeping economic control would eventually lead to the loss of political liberty. The big achievement of the Swatantra Party is in what it prevented India from doing. Uh, the Congress Party was very keen to introduce collective farming in India. The Swatantra Party was one, along with Charan Singh, who, who, by the way, was their agent within the Congress Party, to, to, to the, you know, talking about caucuses. Um, uh, stalled it. So we could have had 25 million people die like they did in uh, Stalin's Russia or in China, Mao's China, if collective farming had been introduced into India and we'd have definitely had a famine. So they did achieve that, but they couldn't prevent a lot of the other left-wing excesses of uh, Nehru and later of his daughter. The Swatantra, the reason I think it disappeared is because in democratic countries, and I include uh, the, the Britain and, and, and America, it appears that elections are won based on identity concerns, mm. not on economic mm. concerns. So if you go and do a campaign saying, I will lower taxes, I will lower import duties, and I will... Uh, have some stable monetary policy. I don't think you're going to win an election. You need a religious, ethnic in India, caste base, language base, subnationalism. You need those identity markers. In the U.S., I mean, the Republican Party is about guns. It's about anti-abortion. It's about anti-immigration. No, these are uh, gut-level issues. They're not kind about of wedge issues. They're not yeah. about free trade and uh, uh, you know um, how do you uh, manage. Uh, uh, monetary policy. So in that context, I am saying that to try to think that today you can revive a Swatantra party, chances are very minimal. It's, it's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, he, uh, but within the Congress, Manmohan Singh and Amrinder Singh represent a possible conservative caucus, mm -hmm. and we can work with them. Mm -hmm. Within the BJP, we have to find equivalent ones and work with them, or Jaitley or somebody. You know, we have to find those those characters, uh, Nirmala Sitaraman, people like that, and work with them to, to move the party in that direction. Uh, that's our best bet. And we should not ignore the regional parties uh, because, um, you know, they generally seem to be intellectually kind of um, very uh, uh, limited. And that's true. I mean, they're kind of, some of them are uh, even comical. But but nevertheless, they're important. They're, they're uh, successful. They have uh, a support base. Uh, and, and they have a point of view. And uh, it's not that they cannot be persuaded. If you remember, when the Indo-U.S. nuclear treaty was being debated in parliament, Finally, the person who was persuaded to support Manmohan Singh was Mulayam Yadav of a re regional party in UP. So, and, you know, as, as a good patriot, he said, hey, I'm going to support this. So it's possible. So, and I think we need to keep working that. 
to try to start a, a Swatantra party, a, a new 21st century, purely conservative, uh, uh, Burkean party without any identity markers. Hey, it's not happening. It's not happening. My guest on the show today is Jerry Rao. Jerry's new book is called The Indian Conservative, A History of Indian Right-Wing Thought. It's available online and in bookstores everywhere. Jerry, thanks for, for coming by. Thanks for making the trip from Chennai. You're off back home, I guess, to Bombay. Uh, best of luck and uh, hope to see you back on the show soon. Thank you so much, Melvin. Enjoyed talking to you. Grant Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Megan Maxwell and Rachel Osnos. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Lauren Dueck is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.